Good evening and uh, welcome to this webinar session organized by Kriya University and LEAD at Kriya. I am Swarnamalia Ganesh, Professor of Practice at Kriya University. Once again, welcome to this webinar, which is part of a series of conversations on gender-based violence in the context of COVID-19 and beyond. This is hosted by Korea University and LEAD, as I said. These discussions are being organized under the aegis of this ongoing research program that uh, LEAD has taken up uh, with the support of the Ford Foundation. Our work by itself is at its nascent stages, but we thought now would be an opportune moment for us to take and seek the um, seek a conversation really on uh, critical on critically thinking what it is to uh, reframe our own selves in this what we have been all calling unprecedented time. Um, the program seeks to convene diverse stakeholders working in the space of gender based violence and also really to unpack pathways uh, that that manifest gender based violence um, using sort of interdisciplinary lenses. In fact, that has been one of Kriya's uh, prime uh, premises on which our education model is also fashioned. So the idea that intersectionality is at the center of what we have to uh, do in terms of thinking even about gender based violence has been our, um, our pushing point. Our first webinar, uh, uh, we had a wonderful guest, Kamala Basinji, who gave us a really powerful talk that in many ways reiterated that we need to see gender-based violence as the larger, more dangerous pandemic, which has been festering amidst us for far too long than even COVID. Uh, that's really how she, she really shifted the entire discourse for us on its head. Uh, combine the pre-existing toxic social norms and gender inequalities, economic and social stress caused by the current pandemic, coupled with restricted movement and social isolation measures that have been put in place. These have all led us to really uh, understand that there's an exponential increase in gender-based violence. I can safely say that if we are all privileged enough to log in on Zoom and sitting here and having this conversation, perhaps gender-based violence is not as much a reality and an immediate menace in our lives as it is in so many other lives of people just in and around us. Many women are in lockdown at home with their abusers while being cut off from normal support services. Therefore, we must strengthen emergency response and support services. I mean, this is a no brainer. Everybody would say that, but how really does one do that? You know, as early as April 9th, a couple of weeks into the lockdown, Rekha Sharma, the chief of uh, NCW, while speaking to India Today said, her colleagues, herself, her staff members, all of them get personal emails by the dozen each day from women under lockdown asking for help. She said this is a very different scenario from when they would be sending their complaints to the NCW website as such. So this personal sort of reaching out manifests a cry for some immediacy. It's, very, it's a very desperate need for help. She also said that she noticed how women who were writing to them did not want to go to the police due to the fear of continual abuse from their abusers who were right there watching over their shoulders. We have been since then getting varying data about gender-based violence from the center and the state machineries, as well as from the police. I mean, it's varying from it's, it's reduced from some kind of skewed data to the spike that has happened. Add to this the larger problem of access itself. How many women in this country have access to a cell phone that is not monitored by their immediate family members or their abuser? And then do they even have the money to recharge that phone enough to make that crucial call? Whom will they actually reach out to? A helpline? A local NGO? Staff of that NGO, like uh, Rekha Sharma was mentioning? Or the police? How will they know what avenues are working after all in this critical hour when most resources have been repurposed or shut down entirely under the COVID crisis? This very worrying scenario 
is not just an Indian problem, for sure. It is a global menace. I mean, after all, in, 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 in a place like France, for example, gender-based violence has increased over 30% since the lockdown, data says. And of course, the UNDP was quick on its heel to make some very important recommendations to countries uh, on how to tackle and respond to this sharp spike under economic and social duress. But the question we all, all of us who have logged in, I presume all of us are from this country, really need to ask is how much has the Indian government paid heed to this? Are we even thinking or have we even begun this process of trying to integrate a gender-based violence uh, understanding at this hour at a national and state level along with the COVID response? Uh, we have with us three very eminent experts who bring collectively a range of expertise from the ground on women's issues, particularly pertaining to gender-based violence. Today, they will speak to us about the delicate intersections of economic pressures, social norms, cultural beliefs, coupled with existing responses to gender-based violence, be it a helpline, civil society support, healthcare, jobs and sustenance, police and legal recourse. Even while India really struggles with these agencies on an everyday basis, they will tell us how the functioning of these agencies already has so many gaps that needed to be filled for better working. And then COVID happened. So this has really turned almost all these agencies on its head. Civil society members by themselves are locked down at their homes perhaps far away from a phone or even ability to go to their shelter homes and you know, render any help. Police are lati charging people or anyone who steps out of their home, let alone a woman who's running out for help. So stepping out, reaching a phone or going to a helpline or accessing a shelter home, which are already perhaps brimming with people or shut down completely. These are all impossibilities in so many lives. So what will a woman do? We are seeing women beaten at home because she fails to cook a meal for her family right on time. This is a news that just came yesterday in the papers that a woman got beaten up by her husband and father-in-law because she, she couldn't complete her chores and cook that meal on time because it's expected as her duty. So her burdens have really increased. We have seen two very gruesome female infanticide in the last week alone in Tamil Nadu, in the rural, in Madurai alone. Uh, because people say that they are under such economic pressures because of COVID. So it's so these have only, I think, helped people to come up with more excuses to do the gruesome things that they've been perpetrating on women. So we have to really start thinking about what it is to live under the roof with your own abuser, what it is to have that neighbor but not being able to reach out, have that cell phone but not being able to make that call. There are so many complexities. So what is the real recourse if there is one? Because COVID and beyond is, is a fancy conversation, but beyond is still a very, very, very meek understanding of what this beyond is. Is COVID going to end or is COVID going to extend and become a part of our reality to the extent that we have to learn to find new measures? So to think through these problems, before I hand over to our very, very eminent speakers and I introduce them, I also wish to acknowledge the continued work towards this gender-based violence project, as well as this particular webinar series put in by uh, the whole team of Kriya Lead, but particularly my, my friends and colleagues, Preeti Rao, Diksha um, Singh and Jagannathan. A big shout out to you guys. Thank you, thank you. And I would, I would begin by thanking our panelists for, for generously joining us in this conversation. I mean, those of you who logged in earlier, you would have, you would have just been privy to their conversations. They are people who are working in the front lines and have been doing so for many years. So they come with a lot of rich experience that I think will help us, if nothing else in the course of today, understand where we are and how complex this problem is. And how do we even begin to think about this. I don't think there's one particular way, but they'll probably help us really see through the multiple directions in which we need to think about this. Uh, the thing that I'm going to do is uh, uh, I'm going to uh, introduce each speaker and then I will hand over the mic to them for them to share their perspectives uh, based on what has been broadly framed here as our concerns. 
and that will be followed by a discussion between the panelists um, because it's very interesting and very rich for us to hear them talk to each other and then please keep your questions and comments coming in so that um, i'll take those questions and address it to the panel and they might uh, choose to answer those questions for all of us um, i will begin by introducing and i'm going to do this they're, they're all very eminent so i will i will give a short introduction as i speak but i've also cut and paste a slightly longer uh, introduction about them for all of us to read uh, so poonam katria ji is the founder and director of society for women's action and training initiatives swati an organization working at the state and national level in india on issues related to violence against women and adolescents their health and women's access and right to land and governance poonam has been active over the last 20 years in a very influential role to end gender based violence and to promote women's empowerment and leadership a tutor an activist an editor and writer her latest work is titled indian feminisms individual and collective journeys poonam ji thank you for joining us and over to you i i just i muted myself so thank you uh, elite and kriya university and thank you swarnamalia for this wonderful opportunity uh, at some at another level this has been quite a period it's been distressful but it's also been enriching i mean so many webinars so much discussion happening on various topics so at one level at once one has also vicariously enjoyed some of this terrible times <laughs> just picking up on your comment about uh, you know how a person uh, abuse severely abused his wife over lunch or not cooking a meal in time yesterday there was a news item and a video going viral about a man hanging himself from his balcony because his over a dispute over the food that his wife had given him and you know i was just thinking what is this and i basically it is a high sense of entitlement and a low threshold of stress so patriarchy combined with pamperedness i think that's what we are seeing right now but anyways coming back to the to the topic so well thank you and uh, i think the timing is, i wish the timing was more opportunity but opportune but i think it's apt because we are just coming out of a lockdown and as india prepares to move out of the lockdown we are being forced to look into the future and grapple with what it would be like to live with the covid 19 we also have the experience of what it was like to live in a lockdown with covid-19 i think india was a late i mean are the cases that came into india the first came came, came in january i think no march um and uh, so we have had the opportunity time to learn from other countries learn from their good practices and learn from their mistakes whether we implement them or not is i think a moot question and that's going to be a challenge and we discuss that today so the distress that we have witnessed during the containment of covid-19 are here to stay and we need to figure out ways of controlling them or else they will devour us much in the way that covid-19 threatens to <clears throat> so you may have other issues an example of this is the number of people dying referring referred to as migrants for whatever reason i somehow don't like that term because it somehow dehumanizes uh, takes the person out of that uh, out of the out of the human being while trying to reach the num no, the, the migrants trying the death of the migrants trying to reach home is over 300 deaths mostly due to accidents hunger dehydration and fatigue faced while walking to their homes this totally avoidable death because of its public nature is getting discussed photographed covered by tv and limited upon and rightfully so so i'm very happy that this is happening and all of us are standing with the migrants but another distress that is boiling and i use deliberately used the term boiling and not brewing is one that is not up for public scrutiny because it happens inside the home and that is violence faced by women and girls and children gender based violence or ipv or family violence is being recognized globally as the pandemic within a pandemic unleashed in the times of covid-19 <clears throat> so in india the architecture of survival support services such as emergency helplines police courts healthcare and psychosocial supports of counseling mediation safe homes and shelter homes has been weak even before the even before the pandemic 
So where these services existed, and they don't exist in several places, they have at most been underfunded, understaffed, and uncoordinated, and not of sufficient quality. We have evidence to say that, for example, in Gujarat, where I work, uh, in 2011, uh, 17 districts had shelter homes. And in 2017, we don't have data post that. Only 12 districts had shelter homes left in them. So of the 33, so I'm just saying how number of shelter homes within the state keep on going down and get underfunded. And that might be true for several other services too. So post the pandemic, what happens? Post the pandemic, these fault lines have become more acute and are leading to what is now being referred to as also the shadow pandemic. And I've been wondering about why the shadow pandemic. And I figured just now, actually, while I was working on this, like on my points, and it is because his uh, experience says that every disaster or every such health emergency leads to an increase in uh, domestic violence or distress of women and girls. And that is why the shadowing of the pandemic, the shadow that follows every pandemic is the distress of the women and girls and children. So that's how we are calling it a shadow pandemic and not a pandemic within a pandemic. Um, so data, for example, indicates that stay at home movement restrictions aim to contain the spread of the virus may be making violence at home much, much worse. Uh, 71% of people in this country families stay in one home, one home, one room dwellings. So where does social distancing in this case goes? And the situation is complex. So you have also reports of men beating up their wives or being abusive because there is no liquor and men abusing because there is liquor. So where do you go? I think Madhu just yesterday shared a report of the police from the Haryana where they said, okay, similar number of phone calls being received. So the issue is complex. Phone calls being received, phone calls not being received. Neither of these can be conjectured as violence happening and not happening. We have to contextualize it in a much more nuanced kind of a way. <clears throat> so at Swati, we have been working, we work with four hospitals uh, and, and we have counseling and support cells in these hospitals where we handle about 900 cases a year. So in this period of the lockdown, the, the cells had to be sort of closed temporarily because our counselors could not have traveled to the hospital so easily. Uh, we decided to do phone follow-ups. Uh, and uh, so that's, I just now, uh, so I've selected four cases that illustrate what happens when survivor support services are not available, are shut down or inaccessible to women. So case number one, and this actually is not ours, it came to us from Madhya Pradesh, <clears throat> an organization called San Sangini. So Sarika got into a brawl with her neighbor and sought help. She sought help from the police to intervene. The police officials created a charge sheet against her instead under section 144 saying for violating the lockdown order. What is the message to the neighbors? You can't complain. You can't go to the police. The police is not there for you. This is lockdown. They're busy with more important things. Lamila's husband gets drunk and beats her almost every day since he has been at home. The police in the village to ensure the lockdown is aware of this. They taunt her instead for not giving him good food when he has so much no work and is frustrated. So I'm just, or is stressed, or is stressed actually, not frustrated. But I'm just saying. So what is the attitude of the police towards domestic violence? We have another case of Jaya is in her seventh month of pregnancy. She has not been able to visit the uh, the community health the community health center for her antenatal checkup. She's anemic, but the ASHA says she has run out of iron folic acid. Uh, we have had cases of women now asking us for pregnancy testing kits, home-based home pregnancy testing kits, because they don't know and they might realize later after three, after two months or something that they are now pregnant and they may have to. So all of that is happening. So uh, another case where Chand, her three-month-old baby, was forcefully kept by her husband on 19th of April. Um, the police referred the case to the court since it was a child custody case and refused to intervene. Chan reached out to us. We have got in touch with, the counsel, with an advocate who then informed us that the courts are closed during this period with all complaint mechanisms shifted to an online system. An application needed to be filled out online, which is quite a challenge for Chan in this case. It took us 10 days to get the custody of a three-month-old baby. So what happens when a, when a legal system breaks down? Kanchan, who's been at a shelter, another case study, Kanchan has been <coughs> staying at a shelter home in Ahmedabad after her husband threw her out. She has no parents. Around the 26th of March, just before, on 23rd is when the, March, uh, the lockdown was declared in India. 
kanchans aren't received a call from the shelter home they wanted to send kanchan out of the shelter home in view of the corona virus situation they asked the aunt if she would be willing to have kanchan back that they would come and drop her kanchans aren't got in touch with the counselor at the mahila sahayata kendra who got in touch with the shelter with the superintendent at the shelter home who informed that she has received a directive from the state government that as, please remove or send back as many residents of the shelter home as possible because you want to reduce the congestion because of social distancing the term used in the policy circular which we happened to see was insist but don't coerce now it's a very tricky one uh, and, and and but in this case so how do you you start sending women back home saying please if you can go and she's uncomfortable because there is loss of dignity uh, i know of situations i don't know whether uh, where governments are known to hire hotels i think i don't know which country it is where they have hired hotels to say okay women can go to these places so that's the point i'm trying to make so at this point there are no set pathways to understand which way the covid-19 crisis will unfold in the in the months to come and maybe years to come i think it's a crisis which is there it's something which is with us to stay however one thing is for certain that the personal crisis resulting from the socio economic distress due to the pandemic is bound to intensify and domestic violence will continue to escalate the challenges of economic dependence helplessness lack of social support mobility posed by covid-19 for survivors to access support access support services are real also real are the challenges of service providers particularly those in the non government sector to provide these services i specifically say this because civil society organizations could not function for a whole lot of time during this period the government has responded by setting up helplines and whatsapp numbers but what is needed are lifelines and not helplines so we must advocate with the government to maintain robust survivor support services i have a few very quick recommendations and i think we can come back to them later when my colleagues also talk one is that there has to be a pandemic act like on the lines of the disaster management act india was totally unprepared for uh, an emergency like this and we had no protocol we fell back on the disaster management act for whatever little that had but by the way even that doesn't have anything on domestic violence and survivor support services secondly the declaring the, uh, domestic violence services as essential part of the essential support services that basically means you give protection to to the care workers you give them necessary social support the necessary uh, protection and uh, and the social security support that you need in order for the social uh, essential services to run this has been a demand even swati has put in a petition uh, to the minister uh women and child and we have so far had not much they have said they are functional there's a difference between keeping services functioning and declaring them as part of the essential support services <clears throat> third and i thought i was just thinking that support services for responding to gb g uh, to gender based violence have to be seen as a as as a distinct set of services right now we club them under generally under psychosocial uh, under police and legal aid support Uh, uh services but in general i feel every one of these institutions need to have a special arm which is essentially looking at gbv so that in these institutions there's somebody batting for the women in case of uh, gender based violence or domestic violence as as it happens uh uh one more thing i think uh, we need smaller shelter homes closer home safe homes very close to where women are closer to their villages so at block level you need smaller shelter homes rather than for example very large shelter homes which are situated or located in districts or in major cities idea being that very often women need short term shelter homes rather than long you know stays for 3 months and 2 months and if we can sort of look at this entire architecture of survivor support services once again and the challenge for us is going to be how do we advocate with the government for funds and for infrastructure support as of now i haven't heard a single word i think kamla was here yes on your panel last time and she says i want the prime minister to be talking about it on monkey bath but well we have all been asking for it and we still have the government to say even a single word uh, <clears throat> of this so last i would just want to round up by saying that gender disparity and violence are an entrenched part of our daily life and cannot be rooted out during the pandemic but this cannot be the reason for us to set it aside while we fix the pandemic so i'm saying that we have to learn to carry it along and i think for the long term 
we have to see to it. For example, we already have news coming in of how girls might be dropping out much more when the schools reopen, who is not going to school, what is going to impact the marriage and marriage, both of whom have a have direct correlation to domestic violence or ex in escalated violence. So I will stop here and then we can talk about it. Thank you. Cannot hear you. Sorry, I was muted. Yes. Thank you very much for uh, really starting off uh, this, this entire conversation by talking to us about, I think, the current scenario and bringing some case studies. But I, I think what, uh, for me, you know, your the suggestions that you made, that you placed here uh, with all of us, and I'm sure you've already uh, mooted some of this with different agencies. The question still remains, uh, you know, is whether, you know, we are, we are at a very delicate stage where we are asking, uh, we're asking the government to really uh, show some accountability. We're asking faith leaders to talk. We're asking, uh, we're asking the government, we're asking the prime minister to talk, but um, how much of that is possible and how much of that is going to actually get done for us to, for us to uh, really tackle this problem immediately from that governance level remains to be seen. It's a distant dream from where we are today, uh, but uh, but I think you've really brought some very critical points. I'm sure uh, the other colleagues on the panel would, uh, would love to uh, uh, converse with you about that. The next panelist I'd like to invite to speak with us is um, Sunita Dhar. She's a senior advisor at uh, Jagori Women's Resource Center. Jagori has worked for over 35 years to end all forms of violence against women, build feminist leadership, and support community collectives to advance their constitutional rights and build safer spaces, cities for women and girls. As an educator, Sunita, and, and as an advocate and participatory researcher, she has designed multi-level, multi-stakeholders programs, contributing to policy, knowledge building, and best practices on women's rights. Sunita has served as a member of NCW Expert Committee all the way till 2019, between 2017 and 19. So she also brings to us, I think, those the experiences of coming from the, because we often, every time we talk about anything to do with women and women's issues, the country, in the country, we talk about the NCWs. So she will also bring on this table for us uh, her experiences from within those portals. Uh, over to you, Sunita Ji. I'm sharing her l longer bio for everybody. Not to worry about that. Thank you. Thank you, Swarna Malia, to Cray University to lead. And I also want to, at the outset, acknowledge uh, the director of Jaguri and my colleagues who are intensively working to address and reach out to women suffering and facing all kinds of violence uh, within Delhi and outside. Um, you know, at this moment, Poonam has said, She's laid the canvas quite extensively, and I don't want to repeat what she has said. But I do want to say that uh, we are all filled with sadness and grief at this moment of time for various reasons, and we know it. And we are f feeling this grief and sadness from a distance. Many of us are not even on the ground. The lockdown has its own limitations. We have our own limitations, though I know many of my co-activists have been on the ground, reaching out to the most vulnerable and marginalized populations. Because not only have we lost lives due to the coronavirus, we've also lost lives due to a host of other reasons, lack of access and reach to public hospitals, the continuum of violence that are faced by people, people trying to go home, the migrants, other communities, and um, also the violence that is not just faced by women and girls, but by trans people, by those that uh, um, come from diverse gender and sexual orientation, sex workers, domestic workers, due to a host of reasons, and I don't need to talk about the cost they're paying because they've lost their lives and their livelihoods and their dignity overnight. So um, this is amongst the worst pandemics we have seen. I cannot forget the face, and I know it's a very small, tiny photograph of Jamalo Matkam that came in the paper post her death, which I think her family put out. And she died on her way home due to exhaustion, lack of nutrition, working at a chili farm in Telangana as a child laborer. 
etched in our souls. We can't forget that and many other such visuals. But you know what has disturbed me the most? That our Nobel Prize winner from India on rights of children and child labor thereafter proposes to the prime minister that an amnesty on child labor prosecutions should be provided for the next three months, which will, what does that mean? It means that we turn our attention away and let an errant state and employers get away. We turn away from the fact that children and girls particularly are trafficked to domestic servitude, to factories as sexual servitude. And as my dear friend Inakshi Ganguly had written, what are we asking for? Are we going to take away the attention from those that are breaking the law and put our attention today on those that are not breaking the law, but because we are you know, into a law and order, we have made the health pandemic into a law and order situation. We are penalizing and criminalizing ordinary citizens. So this is really something that I'm feeling very strongly about what's happened to our notion of accountability, state accountability, private sector accountability, you know, whoever else, employers accountability. Are we forgetting our children? We forget all our rights in this period of the pandemic and only look at the health emergency. We have been asking for ending impunity and restorative justice for victims. And I think we cannot let go some of the concepts and the rights framework and the values that we have formulated and worked on and which have been enshrined in our constitution and our laws and in the UN conventions. I also heard from my colleagues some of the cases that have, uh, the calls that have come to the Jaguri helpline, lifeline as uh, Poonam calls it, about how badly battered one wom woman was at home. And when she tried to go to the police station after much convincing, she did reach the local police station and the MLC couldn't take place and she waited for hours and hours at end and she was tired. So what kind of re-victimization process are we putting victims through? One is the what they face within the confines of their homes and their communities and their families and the other is what is the state doing to them. Another, another incident was that the woman was not even allowed to cross the barriers. The police said no, the COVID-19 protocols are in place and you cannot go till the Jaguri counselor intervened and created the mechanism for her to go and report. So we have suspended the human rights framework to end violence against women. We're asking for intermediary organizations so those that can have access to the local authorities to intervene. The point is that we needed a dedicated police staff on duty. We cannot expect that every policeman of, and woman on duty on the roads for law and order is going to understand what it means to create access for survivors of domestic and other forms of GBV. So I, as you mentioned very rightly, it is not just a public health crisis, right? It is an interconnected economic, social, political, a humanitarian crisis affecting, impacting largely the marginalized communities. We're also seeing other forms of violence, right? One is the domestic violence, one is also intimate partner violence, one is online violence. We have cases in which um, people in uh, relationships are being, uh, um, what can I say, intimidated by their uh, friends, uh, intimate friends online. We're also seeing the violence of the state, the administration, as they access food, as they try and access transportation, as they're on the streets, trying to buy food, sell food. And we also know the kind of you know, pressures women are facing and balancing their multiple care work during the lockdown and the curfews and managing their home. That itself is a form of uh, violence on women, looking at the elasticity of time and the burden of work, taking care of children, running a school at home, taking care of the elderly, et cetera, et cetera. And I know that in the rural areas where Jaguri works with Pradhan, the women in the communities of Jharkhand are today running the community kitchens. They're preparing the masks. They are giving support to the quarantine center. So we're really relying on women as being the frontline respondents. And uh, yet we're not listening to them when they're talking about the violence and the harassment that they face. 
So therefore, to me, somehow, it's very hard for me to accept that uh, violence against women, domestic violence is a shadow pandemic. It's not. It has always been a pandemic. And uh, right now, okay, it's kind of relegated to the back, but it is not a shadow pandemic. It exists right there and needs to be understood such. Um, we also need to understand that there's been a suspension of our fundamental rights, our civil liberties. So the structural violence that we're experiencing also constitutes the canvas of the violence that we're talking about, the right to mobility, the freedom of expression, and so on. We also know that most governments have not incorporated a gendered and a women's human rights framework and analysis into their policy and institutional responses and advisories. And Swati has spoken, I mean, Poonam has spoken about that, and I will not go to that in much detail. So therefore, that is the crisis of governance. There's a lack of accountability, there's a lack of information sharing, there's a lack of due diligence, and, and we have not followed our own laws and policy frameworks. The UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women, Dubravka uh, Simonovic, whom I did meet in October during the Beijing Plus 25 meeting in Bangkok, has said that governments must not allow the extraordinary circumstances and restrictive measures against COVID-19 to lead to the violation of women's rights to a life free from violence. And when we talk about a life free from violence, and we have to look at it in its holistic sense, we also know, and, and Puna has said, women's groups have tried, sent memos to the Women's Commission, to the Ministry, to the chief ministers of their respective states to declare violence against women as part of the essential services and therefore to give it um, the resources, the political will, uh, the infrastructure that it requires. But we have not, we have not been awarded that status as yet. We also know that uh, we need far more political will at this moment of time. Now, how have the responses worked? Now, you know, we're seeing two kinds of reporting that's taking place so far. One of them is that there has been spike in the reporting. One of them is that in the initial periods, um, the calls and the complaints that were received on helplines and WhatsApp messages had declined in comparison to a previous month or to a previous year. We have the NCW data and that is being updated on a regular basis. But my question is, why are we to look at the journalists and the academics who are writing the newspapers for the data? Why don't we have a dashboard? We have a dashboard for Corona every day. What's happened to our dashboard on violence against women? Not just at this period of time. Why can't we get regular data? Why don't we know what's happening in every state? What are the kinds of complaints that have come? Why is it not on the website? I've been trying to search for data and I have to look at newspaper writings and articles and you know people speaking on webinars etc so i think we certainly need information and we need them to be disaggregated by age by other variables who are these women they all have a face they have an identity where do they come from is it in urban areas is it in rural areas etc cetera, etc cetera. we need disaggregated data we have committed to sdg5 and in our commitment, data is critical. We have built the infrastructure in Niti Aayog to collect such data. I'd like to know where it is right now and why can't we recall that, that uh, framework and that uh, you know, mechanism to put the data into place. We also, so you know, for lack of such data, Jaguri has been doing enormous work in the last two months besides uh, helpline and outreach services, counseling services, referral services. We have reached up to more than 100 women in this period of time, but we've also compiled information on helplines, on shelters, on one-stop centers. We've tried calling them across many states. Are they functional? Can women access them? What does it take to reach them? Etc. Etc. That should not have been our duty. That should have been the duty of the state to declare and say, yes, these are our numbers. These are our things. These are functional helplines and these are the emergency services. So this is what I'm saying. We're outside the system. We're getting the data out there, but yet we are not quite sure that when a woman tries to um, access the, the, the service, she will get access to it or not. Now, what does it take for an NGO? As uh, Poonam has also mentioned, 
we don't have assets. We don't have vehicles. We don't have access to passes. We don't have, we don't have ambulances. We don't have, uh, you know, we don't have access to the state's formal services. So at the end of the day, I think we need a new form of registration. We need NGOs and the government to work together. That's what we have been working on. While we may question governments on their compliance with national laws and constitutional uh, obligations, we also work with governments. You cannot deal with this issue in isolation. If every NGO does its little work in its little community, all of which is very meaningful, the impact is not going to be huge. We need to share resources. We need to have inputs. We need access to the Nirbhaya funds. So I think time has come when we can no longer work in this fragmented manner. We just have to reestablish a new way of working guided by principles that we agreed to. Um, we have also, Jaguri has undergone gender budget studies in the past in Delhi, in Charkand. We have recently done a study. All of this is available on our website, so I'm not going to go into details on um, shelters for women and what a feminist vision of having a shelter for women, for trans people, for queer communities, also looking at other marginal groups, those coming from the SCST communities, those that are disabled, etc. What should that be? The recommendations of looking at how widows have access to Swadhar homes are available on the NCW website. NCW has done a series of studies. It has also put together data. It has done a countrywide study. I don't know whether it's been completed or not on Swadhar homes and their services. So we need to make sure that all these services are linked to both emergency health, reproductive rights, sexual health services, and safe services for women and girls. I also want to say very clearly that we don't have protocols in place. Now, I know that uh, Delhi government has testified to the High Court on a petition that was filed by an NGO in Delhi uh, that they have instituted new protocols for their protection officers, for their staff, for uh, guiding them to respond into the, uh, in this emergency time. But I haven't seen them, so I have no access to those protocols. So essentially what we need is we need, uh, we need protocols, we need standardized trainings, we need a dedicated police force. We know we have gender deaths in police stations. What's happening to them? Are they doubling up on other duties? Because I know that the, the demands on the government for relief work is so high, I can quite understand the pressures. But that's where they have to work in uh, cooperation with NGOs. I also know that in Maharashtra, NGO Akshara has actually done some kinds of online training on uh, for protection officers. So we need online um, legal literacy trainings for those women who want access, who want to access their rights, need to know whether they can go to court. The DLSAs, the others all have to come on board and reach out to these women. Essentially, what I'm saying is the last mile connectivity. Today, it's the first mile and the last mile connectivity for most survivors of violence is missing. Essentially, it's missing in the way that the system has set itself up. So therefore, when we look at uh, what needs to be done, I think we need inclusive, participatory, and non-discriminatory policies and practices. We need to make sure we're working within the framework of human rights and substantive equality. Uh, we cannot operate within a policing or a law and order framework. That is not right. We need compassion. We need care. We need to touch. We need to reach. We need to listen. And with that, I will add to the conversation as we proceed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sunita ji. Um, I think uh, you have taken this conversation forward. But as many of our students from Korea who are young undergraduate students who are also listening in, um, I'm sure, you know, as young people who are who are listening to all of this data that's pouring in, one overwhelming feeling that they would have is the sense of helplessness and this this whole sense of who is finally accountable, whom do we hold responsible and accountable for what needs to be done. Uh, but through the course of your conversation with us, you have really also placed a lot of very uh, I think useful and critical ways in which. NGOs, civil societies, and perhaps when you spoke about compassion, even individuals really taking the onus 
on themselves, even as we demand more accountability from government agencies and the dispensation itself. Um, thank you so much for that. Uh, I, with that, I will move on to our next uh, panelist, Madhu Mehra. She is the executive director of Partners for Law in Development. She's a lawyer and a researcher whose work in writings over the last 25 years covers issues relating to gender, sexuality, identity politics, violence against women, access to justice and the law. She has contributed towards law reform processes relating to sexual violence and harassment. And within the PLD, which is uh, something that she's co-founded with, uh, with her colleagues, partners for law and development, has undertaken legal advocacy for the decriminalization of homosexuality, adultery, and adolescent sexuality. She has contributed to women's rights work in Asia Pacific, and undertook the review of 15 years of the mandate of the UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women between 1994 and 2009 for the Office of the High Commission of Human Rights. Over to you, Madhuji. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Again, a very important conversation uh, that we must probably continue to have over um, the coming months. Uh, I don't see uh, uh, any kind of uh, um, resolution or, you know, light um, as, you know, as, as both Sunita and Poonam have pointed out, the, the landscape is so totally changed that we are still scrambling um, to find, uh, to make sense of what needs to be done. But let me just uh, come back to uh, what what, what really did the lockdown do? Uh, and in India, we've seen one of the most stringent lockdowns being enforced, which was, um, you know, like curfew that one does in, in a, as, you know, in a law and order, when a law and order situation arises. Um, what does being at home mean? Um, and what does being with the family really mean? What does uh, being confined within communities uh, that are that are sort of uh, regulated by RWAs, by societies, by um, the head of the household, and uh, you know, or slum leaders. What does it look like for women? I think that's a question that the women's movement has, in any way, grappled with for such a long time and has worked very hard to ensure that women have spaces outside the home, they have reasons to occupy the public space, and in, in a sense create um, so that they're not completely confined as they traditionally meant to in, in the private space. Uh, so I think that lockdown has completely inverted that idea of, of having a place outside the home to go to. Many of the women who are working are often uh, openly share that they need to come to work because they need a place outside the home. They need to be outside the home for n number of the hours a day. So, I mean, people really, women do find different ways of having to escape the home because the home is really not the safest place for women. And um, Safety is really contingent about uh, contingent on notions of uh, equality or at least equity of family care, nurturance, and access to many things: access to essential services, access to food and nutrition, access to sanitation, and almost each and everything that underpins the notions of security and equity has been, have been turned on its head under the lockdown and the pandemic. So we, we really have nothing that is um, that, that anymore that we had struggled to create over decades uh, as a minimum safety net for women. Uh, for, for women. Uh, we have, uh, particularly in situations where you have no access to drinking water, you have no access to toilets, uh, which are immediate, um, and where uh, you don't even have access to security of tenure. I mean, let's not forget that 
a large number of people are moving towards their villages not because not because simply because of the pandemic they've been just evicted they've been evicted from homes they have no rent to pay and there is no uh, guarantee there is no sort of financial support which kicked in um and the idea that that we are not a level playing field either within the home or within society somehow completely seems to have escaped our preparation for the lockdown and our preparations for the slowdown um if it's not a level playing field then who's going to be thrown under the bus really and i think that's what we are seeing we are seeing violations at such an enormous scale that it's just completely astounding us we've not seen visuals across the country not just in limited pockets of this kind where some of us are ensconced at home with access to digital worlds and you know digital connections and then there are people without food security without shelter i mean just in the scorching heat on their two feet so i think it's it's a time that has um of of great disturbance which has disrupted every notion of of both safety and and what we had considered as an emergency response i mean they've all gone out of the window um and let's not forget that some of the reports that are coming of migrants who have reached home it's not as if everyone is embracing them into their fold um there are homes which are dismantled there are homes which are yet to be constructed there's the whole quarantine and yet no quarantine facility so people have been left on the outskirts um and then there's this fear that they're bringing they carrying um uh, infection uh so there's social ostracism of a different kind playing out so i it's it's so multi layered you know old violations new violations that just to grapple with it we haven't even seen sort of an emergency convening call by the state uh we would like to see just as say this webinar is being held why are there not sort of series of webinars organized by the state calling upon whatever resources we may have you know um but just cobbling together everybody around to figure out how to respond in this situation two months down we still haven't seen that and i think um, um i think let's also just try to remember who what kinds of violence are we looking at and what was the response in what we call normal times how was the no- how safe was the normal times for most women uh so of course we have the domestic violence or the matrimonial sort of violence which is most squarely recognized as violence and rape which is the other which is sort of has a long history of recognition almost everything else again is is uh very hard to argue very hard to convince and very easy to dismiss because there's a large blindness towards say anything that's short of rape um anything that's not brutal um for uh, an and child sexual abuse or whatever happens with the family members is also one of the most difficult things to report um so and can you imagine what it must be like to be locked in with your abusers i mean that's something that you would raise uh but also uh interpart partner violence which is non marital in nature or just uh, you know a lot of young people are turning uh, there's high levels of addiction to to uh, the internet as an escape route because constantly we are being told well that's something that we can you know sort of escape to and what are people experiencing there um, we haven't even begun to grasp that um then there is of course anybody who's uh, sort of gender queer uh and a range of you know kinds of disabilities are other sort of very very vulnerable place people uh, make people very vulnerable within their own homes and their communities and i've also interestingly talking to uh, colleagues and friends um learned that a lot of young women who wanted to take a walk outside have been subject to policing 
um, in terms of, because that's something so easy to do. Who is the most who's going to be sort of, who's most likely to be policed? Women's bodies in the, in the best of times are policed. So, um, so here you have, um, uh, a, you know, and, and in addition to this, something that we wouldn't ordinarily call violence, but and would be very hard to convince, but this disproportionate and staggering burden of housework, which women as wives and mothers particularly are, are having to uh, reckon with in this moment. And then because everybody else is either just at home and bored or facing own anxieties, because that, that makes everybody else very sort of volatile, you know, when you have a loss of job, a loss of income, an uncertainty, not being able to go out, how the other family members who are in more dominant positions sort of react or deal with their anxieties is something that you've already pointed out, you know, the, the suicides, the murders, and um, so on. Uh, so I think this, uh, this, kind of, this, um, this kind of situation where your own, um, you know, uh, your own, the foundational thing you call home is in flux for many people. We haven't even talked about the violence, gender-based violence amongst the migrants. We, I'm, I'm sure there are sort of women-headed households and women on the roads uh, dependent on bands of, you know, or, or larger groups. Uh, what does it mean for them to be in that situation? Uh, so, so what does it mean for women to be quarantined alone? Who do you complain to in, in, in a quarantine if you, I mean, gender-based violence is so intricately and intimately part of life experiences um, that it's not just about, you know, it's not going to be suspended merely because we are in an emergency or in quarantine. So, uh, and in the best of situations, we have a PLD study on the one-stop uh, crisis centers in Delhi, which were meant to be a coordinated response. You know, that's how they were envisaged as. But uh, they sort of were reduced eventually to just carrying out medical legal um, work for rape cases, uh, which is just to sort of... Uh, uh, take, uh, you know, um, uh, take women to the hospitals, get a medical examination. And uh, for and in the rape trial study that PLD carried out post-2013, when uh, between 2014 and 2015, when the maximum amount of sort of trainings and inputs had been given to the special courts and the systems were at their best, so to say, because here's a new law, law, law reform and uh, all the investment that has been made. Uh, but we found that registering an FIR is difficult. We found that women have to spend hours convincing and, and the, the effort from the system is that if she is, let's see how long she'll stick it out because you just don't want to increase your uh, case casework or caseload. Um, you have the you, Jaguri and others, the shelter home, um, both Swati and Jaguri have been part of that larger national coalition. The state of shelter homes, is that a place where women are safe, is a question worth asking. Uh, is, that a, is that a place where most women want to go to or they'd return home immediately? In some of our studies, women have opted to return home. Uh, again, you know, all the studies done on Domestic Violence Act show that the protection officers are mostly on dual charge and they're, 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 all the positions are not filled. So we are now hoping for protection officers to act when in what was the pre-COVID period, there was, there was uh, uh, many shortcomings there. So really the question is, um, at this juncture, who are we making these demands on? Um, there was a time when the women's movement really um, did everything hands-on. There was crisis intervention, uh, which was, you know, people were, you know, whether it's the dowry deaths or the rapes and, you know, protests and 
everybody was in the front lines because there was no structure. And I think we've come to a place where the drawing board is again, sort of, we have to come back to the drawing board to see what is our role, because clearly we can keep asking the state theoretically um, as the, you know, to provide us with these services. The institutions that we have are not at their best. The helplines are simply not at their best. Uh, so what now, um, where, what is the notion of community we can build now? Of course, we are not suggesting we give up working on uh, with the state or demanding what we have to, but uh, really window dressings are all that we have got and we spend a lot of time and energy engaging with that and tinkering with that. Should we not be demanding that, you know, again, that's the suggestion that, uh, that uh, Sunita uh, you know, uh, gave that NGOs should be absolutely in partnership with the state. And again, the resources, we've seen a shortfall in resources why, you know, the, the most of the resources have ro been rolled back uh, uh, across board, um, not just in COVID, but before COVID. COVID has created a new emergency. And this is not going to go away. Uh, but uh, uh, what is our claim to resources? Um, I think that's a critical question. Uh, what and and already and we also are in an environment where NGOs, the very idea of NGOs is is being you know come under come under cloud, come under a lot of suspicion. Um, so let's, it's, it's really something that we need to resurrect at this point and get our rightful claim because um, who is the one who's been talking about domestic violence? Who is the one who's on the front line? And, you know, much of many of our volunteers and staff are at the front line, but they're at risk. Who's going to hold them through an emergency if they fall sick? Um, so there is also that, I mean, the earlier community support that we could count upon today is again under crisis because people can't just take anybody in their homes. Um, your building societies are not allowing strangers in, not allowing visitors in. There's such a lot of surveillance. So what do you do here if you want to reach out and hold hands? Um, so I think there's just, we're, we're in a flux at this moment and we need to uh, come back to the drawing board is, is, my, uh, is my sense as uh, simultaneously continue with our demands of the state. Thank you very much, Madhuji. Um, I think if anything, you have also opened a floodgate of the floodgate of complexities that really uh, compound this problem. And uh, the notion that when we, the minute we say gender-based violence, we think of violence in the, in the obvious sense in terms of rape and in terms of very violent physical apparent violence versus the, the more subtle, the, more, the, the, the kind of violence that doesn't meet the eye very often. And the kinds of responses that, that were once at least partially possible now having been completely, uh, you know, dysfunctional. And the, the fact that, as Sunita ji had said, state resources, uh, NGO resources are limited, the infrastructure is limited, state's role is, has been arbitrary, at least with the COVID response, because they've, they've had other fire, fire, fires to fight. But accountability ultimately rests on their shoulders. But you also brought back to us the, the question that we have to ask ourselves, how do we come back to the drawing board to start really, if anything, from the very scratch to start thinking of what it is to live with COVID and therefore what it is to sort of reevaluate our own positions. One of the things that you really said, and uh, it brings us uh, at Kriya lead to the very basics of where we began was we were thinking of gender based violence as a project in the public space when we began. But today, as you have rightly said, the question of space has been obscured. We don't know what is public and private anymore. When, a, when people are migrating, what is that space? When people are walking. So, so there are so many questions that comes up uh, regarding just the definition of space itself uh, in our minds. So in the interest of time, we are, uh, we are at 6.05 and we have uh, a lot of 
questions from the participants, uh, from the uh, attendees as well. Uh, it'll be great if the three of you can just maybe address very briefly for us, uh, or uh, either of you, about the idea of space. And then I will stop questions and I'll just probably post a few questions from the, uh, from the attendees, if that's okay. Or unless you want to say something else to add to the discussion already, any of you. I've already answered some questions that have come up in the Q&A. Right. Right. Uh, I'd just like to post a few that have not been answered yet. And then, uh, of course, uh, I, would, I would think that you, you might want to uh, uh, have a discussion amidst yourselves. Or should I just, uh, sh shall we address the space question and then perhaps move forward from there, if that's okay? Let me uh, talk a little bit about the public private, you know, because Jaguri had done this study on access to um, water sanitation drainage in one of the communities, which actually became a resettlement colony, but comprised initially of an evicted population from Yamuna Pushta uh, to Bhavana, which is where we are located now. They were an evicted community and they have rebuilt their lives with great difficulty. Um, and don't have access and don't have tenure and many other services. We found that because um, the master plan of Delhi was not uh, taken into account, the size of their plots for an average family of five to seven was much less than it should have been. Now, once that happens, a lot of your private chores, so to speak, come out into the public space, right? You're washing, your um, home-based work, in any case, people who are into productive work, your collection of uh, water, your bathing the babies, everything is in the public space. So in any case, the public and the private sphere had merged quite a bit. And uh, access to public community toilets were very hard because they had a time factor to it. And over time, in these tiny little spot spaces that they lived in, they also had to make um, a toilet for the girls and the women because of safety and other reasons. Now today, the only way we're seeing what's happening in the private domain of those that have homes and are with families, Madhu has spoken quite elaborately on that. Mm -hmm. They're not seen to us as such, except that we hear them on the telephone, they reach out to us, some of them have been able to access shelter homes, etc. But the public violence that's being faced it's also faced by women and children. Now, we're not, we don't have a gendered analysis of that. We don't have the data because right now we are overwhelmed by what's happening and, uh, and how to respond to it. Civil society in its own way is doing, I mean, the prime minister said civil society should support relief measures, but civil society's funds have been constrained as we all know. And we are now reporting to the government on what we are doing. So some of us are also reporting on reporting to the government every month on what we do right, with yeah. to cases of violence against women. So as we are reporting all of this, where is all this data? Who's putting it together? Why are we not being fed back this data so that we know what is happening in the public space as well? What is happening in the private domain as well? And to me, this intersectionality and intersectorality of approaches has all got fragmented. You know, we, We've lost our bearing, we've lost a foothold. And I really think that the public space violence is enormous at this period of time because there are more people out on the streets than they are within homes. And as they go back, they're again in a semi-public uh, space, which is either the quarantine center or it's a school or it's a tree on which they self-quarantine. We've seen images of men and women self-quarantining themselves on the tree because their family members are not letting them in. So I don't know what's happened to their lives. How, how do they claim their dignity and their lives? How do they, I think people are in search of themselves. We have lost ourselves in, the, in, in this crisis tremendously. That's all I have to say. Can I come in? Sure. So I was just, I think I, uh, Sunita sort of picked up that very well. And one question that sort of kept on coming to me while well, this entire migrant crisis was is on is that the migrant is also a woman and i hardly ever i've yet to find a single story where or, or or even a single mention of what might be happening to this woman does she need sanitary napkins 
Does she need to defecate? Does she have a shortage of public spaces where she can go to? All we see is pictures of women carrying children on their suitcases. I agree with that, but that's not her only identity. And so that's one part of the story and what is happening to that. And that's where I think even a lot of organizations were working on with the unorganized sector, with migrants are equally guilty of. I think two reports have been released in this period. And so there were two long webinars and not a single mention of what is happen, happening with the woman migrant. It was all about the male migrant and the stress and the and the distress and the stress, you know, the entire impact on that. So I think that's one point. But I just also want to come back to, okay, so there's one rural person who's walking on the road, who's out on the street in the public domain. There's no private uh, there. And then you have the village rural situation where people are contained contained within that village since the last two months. We have situations where there is one uh, police post there, police posted there from, I was talking to some people and they said from 7.30 to 9 o'clock, there is a policeman there who doesn't allow anybody to go out. Okay, so that's another kind of a containment happening there. And what is happening with the women in that where, you see, uh, the, so there's one public which the women access, but there's another public which the women don't access, which is the market, the bazaar, the, the, the bus stand, the village square. So, and those places are highly contested and are bound to get more contested because now you want to control women's employment because there are more men who are unemployed for back home. There is, uh, so you want to contain girls' mobility because there is more fear of sexual violence. You want to control sexuality because, you, and you want to get girls married early, girls dropping out of school. So I think this entire notion of public space and women's access to public space of a certain nature, particularly in rural India, I think we are, I think the, the space for contention there is going to become, uh, is going to shrink. And when a parent says, I need to get her married early or I can't send her to school, the earlier arguments are going to, the arguments are going to get more difficult. The appeals to logic or the... Right. Um... So if it's okay with the panel, can I read out a couple of questions that have come our way? Actually, quite a few, but I'll address at least, uh, we'll hope to address a few. The very first question that came in was from uh, Reeti M. And um, she says, I have previously worked directly with district administration some time back, uh, was reached out from another district administration, SDM, seeking help in addressing GBB. Um, they are keen in both curative and, pre and pre uh, preventive measures. She's asking, what are the best frameworks to do this? Meaning, best frameworks to? Best frameworks to really sort of create a, cur a curative and preventive measure uh, in, in consonance with the different uh, district, district administrations. So there is already, you know, a whole, uh, um, you know, a response system in terms of uh, the police in terms of getting an order from the court. Uh, so that is the framework that one could go back to, except that the courts are not functioning. They're functioning very skeletally and the movement is limited. So I think uh, the issue is, yes, that is a framework one could go back to or get it activated. Uh, so the answer is reactivate that system. Um, right now, from what I know, is women are taking photographs of their abuse, of injuries, and sending it out. And which means that if you don't have physical injuries, you're not going to be able to convince the person on the other side to take any action. So we have to start a system of, of we have to restore that system in some ways. Women can't go out of the building, um, you know, those who are living in building complexes. And elsewhere as well, women's movement is being, is being uh, and, and that they're tied up with so much of domestic work. So the earlier idea that your husband goes out of for work, I mean, again, I'm talking about matrimonial violence. You get some free time to reach another person and talk. Is, is that has sort of broken down. So, uh, yeah, I think, I think one is to definitely activate the old system. 
um, but also to reach out, have some frontline people reaching out to women, reaching out to RWAs, because the RWAs are the most patriarchal uh, bodies, uh, societies, you know, in buildings and, and getting sort of uh, interventions out in slum clusters. So I think that would be uh, an important thing because right now the legal system is not working. We have um, women who are already separated and drawing maintenance through 125 um, CRPC. What if, you know, what, if their next maintenance doesn't come, what do they do? The courts have shut down. It's a very skeletal kind of system that is working. I'd also like to come in here that uh, we've been told to live with the virus. Yeah. We've not been told to live not with violence with people we work with, people who matter to us, and people who are not in our homes right now, and who have been with us for years serving us. So I think- but Social you know, distancing and body distancing. Our messaging is so wrong. We have communalized the virus. We have stigmatized communities. We continue doing everything that's outside any framework of human dignity and respect. So I think we just have to recall this kind of communications. I read a very interesting article by a president of an RWA who talked about the norms and protocols by which they were working and allowing people to take their decisions, respecting the agency of families, respecting the agency of workers and, and space for negotiations on how the service providers could access homes and public spaces in that community. I agree with the Madhu. We, even during our Safe Cities campaign, the most difficult work is with the RWAs because they're feudal, they're patriarchal, they're classes, they're arrogant, and they are men, largely. And even for domestic workers' rights, when we were trying to do an education campaign, we found it very difficult to reach out to them. So I think we need a space for preventive education. Now, just let's look at a recent incident, the boy locker room. And what do we need to do there? Not like what the DCW chairperson has said, put them, imprison them, criminal action. We need to work on mindset reforms continuously. We need to talk, we need to dialogue. And I know some groups are doing very meaningful work by reaching out materials to schools. Even NCW has developed a curriculum in which Jaguri has, I have um, part, uh, worked on some of that content on rights of young people, on safety, on violence. It's an online course. So there are ways we can recall the education through the digital medium. We know that's limited. Everyone does not have access. We can use the radio. I don't know how the radios are working these days. I have no idea. But the community radio stations that do work in rural areas are trying through the IVR, through the WhatsApp. So there are ways by which positive communications on gender equality, non-discrimination, respect can be done. I know that the women in the rural areas who have nurtured and built their collectives with so much blood and sweat, how much they are taking care of each other. They miss, they miss the physical presence. They miss the care to themselves, right? Earlier, a group of 10 and 12 would sit every week and they would talk with each other and they would do their work. They miss that care. But yes, even within that, I am so impressed by the solidarity that they are extending. And I think that there is space for solidarity. I think that is happening. And we need to write some of those positive stories. I've heard of women peasants, women in collectives, actually collecting money to feed the migrants and those that are coming into back homes and on the streets. So there's a lot of goodness that is also there amongst all of this that is happening in the midst of this uh, awful um, stigmatization that is happening. So I just wanted to refer to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think one of the questions, I mean, that I really personally want to ask is also, you know, you brought up the question of uh, the informal support systems and mechanisms, given the fact that, uh, uh, you know, we have so many traditional social and gender norms that, that really need to be shifting, at least now more than ever. And you, you did mention about how we can affect those changes and where we need to begin from, if at all. And, uh, my question is, the, you know, the stakeholders here are the NGOs. We have 
you know, the state, we have the police, we have civil society, we have well-meaning people from the public. But other than this, can we think outside of this and see if there is any possibility to draw, draw from the larger pool of the population people who are not traditionally considered as allies towards a project such as this, where we want to use them towards say sensitizing or at least getting the larger message out. Uh, for example, you know, uh, I think one of you spoke about, uh, or Kamla ji was talking about the PM having to come out and speak. Now, I don't know how much we can influence the PM to do that, but what about thought leaders? What about all those scores of motivational speakers? What about religious leaders? Where are they? Is there a way that uh, we can also think of putting pressure on them to act more responsibility at this time? Will it make a difference? And what kind of... Yeah. I uh, was with, I attended one webinar in which uh, there was Sri Sri Ravi Shankar and there was uh, 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 Indra Jaisingh and she kept on bringing the issue back to domestic violence and him using his influence with the prime minister or with the powers that be to just say that one word yeah. and he skirted it through the entire one hour conversation. And, you know, there were like at least some thousands of people who were listening in and you should have seen the comments that they were making on what Indra Jai Singh was that time asking him to do. And she's, you know, so I'm just saying, so thought leaders come with a lot of baggage. I mean, so they may say one thing, but they may be anti-Muslims, they may be anti-minorities, they may have other... Uh, issues with uh, all of that. But I think one of the things that we can revive, uh, and I think it's been sort of, I think we need to go back to our earlier, I think the movement needs to revive itself once again. The people to people movement, I think for the last few years, I think it's all become online, virtual space, platforms. But you know, last five years, I've yet to see in a big way, there may be one or two exceptions, but 5,000 women marching on the streets. We haven't seen those. Women's yeah. movement is a product of that. I mean, that's how we, we did our advocacy. That's how we sort of connected with each other. So I think that's going to be one. So we, for example, the idea of uh, women's courts, the Nari Adalats, the Mahila Nyay Panchayat, the gender just committees in every, every community, you know, they, and they are informed by the law of the land. That's why we call them gender just. Like they are, uh, they are gender equal and they are informed by the law of land. So if, unless we pick up those once again, I think we don't have much of a future left for the women's movement as far it, as it goes. And then we also need to think in terms of how do we, but we still need to work with the government. In a pandemic like this, to, the truth is that CSOs are very small. Their role is very limited. And so to that extent, and, and considering that the government doesn't think they are important, so we have a double whammy here, a double uh, issue here, that we are not important and, the, uh, and we can't impact too much because we have limited reach, and then you're not very important, considered important. By the government. Right. So how do you sort of reach out to this government for this dialogue? Right. Madhuji, did you want to come in? Yeah, I, you know, I think that what's happening is that... Um, Yes, one crisis is eclipsing another, but this crisis that we are seeing has deepened our class divide. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea that we want to return to a welfare, a notion where welfare is priority, uh, where some things are public good, whether it's, it's healthcare, whether it's the welfare system, whether it's education, uh, we want to go back to these ideas which, which have lost, which have taken such a beating in the last, uh, you know, uh, decade. Uh, so, what, so what we're asking for is anyway being very stigmatized and, and in a sense rejected. Um, and everyone keeps talking about this free market, free market where somehow, you know, which will spiral us into a, a sort of a healthy, uh, egalitarian uh, society. It's not happening. Now more than ever, those who've gone down are not going to recover anytime soon. They may just go deeper and deeper down. So uh, it's a very scary situation where we definitely need to sort of 
talk about these things and and uh, recover the kind of community activism that we uh, that you know poonam just spoke of remember that uh, much of the queer activism and support systems are still at the community level people house victims in each other's homes um there is no official space you know so i think in uh, in uh, we have to sort of have both because there was for too long we worked towards institutionalizing everything and expecting that these then once these institutions were created we began to invest time in training them thinking that all they need is some sensitization it doesn't happen uh what we've seen for example in Rajasthan where you have the uh the you know the women's police stations uh the M uh mahila sala suraksha kendra because the jaipur one was so good they replicated that across districts but they are not the same as the jaipur one so you can't just replicate an idea there has to be an ideology there has to be passion there has to be commitment and that just doesn't come when you somehow just photocopy that 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 model uh so we have to we have to go back to to restoring that uh because it's otherwise we we just become so professional in terms of going to meetings giving advice and that it doesn't percolate down anywhere um and i think uh, beginning with also universities universities are a very important space how do we inculcate that value in young people and i think what is troubling today is that the universities are creating a lot of people who are just going to gravitate to corporate jobs uh i mean i'm talking about the law school certainly mm. um and that that sense of you have the boys locker room coming from very elite places right so what is the value system we seem to be falling on on multiple fronts so how do we create that sense of co construct that collectively um taking a bit of the old restoring the old but working with with what we have as well right thank you so much um i mean we have a lot of questions pouring in from uh, all our attendees if uh, if the panelists don't have a problem can we extend this session by say 10 minutes so that we can address a few of those yeah. critical yeah. questions yeah, yeah. thank you so much um sinta ji poonam ji are you okay with that yeah thank you uh so i think we have a question from um asha ramesh uh, she's an activist and researcher from uh, bengaluru we and know her question, well yeah she's a colleague yeah hi Hi. So her question is: uh, uh, Can't the Anganwadi's become sort of the first uh, point of contact uh, to address uh, domestic violence? Uh, so, would one of you like to take? So, I I do want to jump in here. I think the Anganwadi's and the Asha workers are an incredible strength. But remember, they are volunteers. They are not official government employees. and the let's let's dignify the kind of work that their role by giving them a secure job and all the support that comes with a secure government job so i would i would go with that but we've already overburdened them they're the first people we think of for everything but they don't even have a tenure so madhu ji i mean as a sort of an addition to her question then i mean if uh if our first responses say for example were to become anganwadis and you know civil society and people who are not from within the system and if the system is under lockdown or is shut down and is dysfunctional then what is the next logical step to take you know the first responders have largely been women's groups and collectives the informal collectives the formal collectives the ngos the women's not the ngos the women's organizations Mm-hmm. and i think that um, while the asha worker gets access to information because she goes house to house and she doesn't have the support of the ecosystem see mm-hmm. what's happening is the the um, whatever counseling centers referral lines as we have talked earlier they just don't exist below the district levels they don't exist in the villages and therefore building uh, communities of women to deal with this giving them tablets and pradhan there is a core group of women that work and go home to home and also reach out to women on the telephone 
to find out what they're facing, what kind of support they need. And I agree with what Poonam has said. And, you know, the feminist notion of justice, we have to find alternative mm. ways of mm. seeking resolution and justice. We don't want vigilante groups, but we want some form of mediation, some form of support for women, a safe zone for women. It need not be a shelter home today. Most of the shelter homes are overcrowded spaces with no funds, no infrastructure, etc. And we need, people used to go to each other's homes. I mean, in Jagori, our uh, frontline workers actually kept uh, women at their own homes at night or in the Jagori office, small office in the community, which now everything under lockdown is gone. So I think it is these collectives. We have to build collectives to reach out to women. We cannot cut out violence against women's services from health services to other services. So this intersectional approach is something we need a core group that works across disciplines. I mean, that was part of your conversation today. We cannot segment services, you know, specialized mental health service providers, specialized DV providers, specialized sexual violence providers. Yes, we need expertise at some point, but at some level, we need a core group that reaches out, that can refer them, that can support them. So I think women's groups can play a great role, but we know that there's a limitation there. But we need to reorganize ourselves. We need to find ways to uh, catalyze ourselves beyond what we are today. Mm -hmm. Poonamji, you want to come in? Yeah, I was just thinking in terms of, you know, where do you start and where do you end? And that is where we have always, as a women's movement and through the PWDVA, we have spoken about multi-agency coordinated response. I think for me, that's a very meaningful term as to whichever point a woman walks in, the rest of the system has to coordinate with itself. So idea is she can come to, to a police person, she can come into a health system, she can come to a counselor sitting in an OSCC and the rest of the coordination happens. Ultimately, at, unfortunately, except for the PWDVA and the protection officer, we, we do not have the notion of uh, coordinated response in any other system. Coming back to the Asha worker, I do think she's very valuable, but unless she's given the status that she, again, if she's going to provide this essential services, she needs to be given the social protection, the necessary uh, recognition. I think she's a very, very valuable uh, person to address domestic violence because in a study that we did with 1,014 ASHA workers, 90% of the ASHA workers, the women they said were facing domestic violence, those women reported facing domestic violence. 80% of those women had come to the ASHA workers seeking help. So I'm just saying there's a connect. At the same time, you have to see to it that she is not at risk because she's the poorest and the most marginal woman in the village. And if she has to do her job. So I'm just saying again, like Sunita said, we need to sit on the drawing board. There are no quick answers. But I think the health sector response is a very, very safe and secure response in that sense. Of time. Right. Thank you. Uh, I can, we can take one more question. This is again from another Asha Bhavani. I don't know if it's the same person. It says Asha, Asha Bhavani R. By speaking about changing mindsets, set, sets, are there ways to change the mindset of traditional married women who have been brought up by normalizing the, mar the marital rape and violence? How can we really reach out to each and every household to make the woman realize that they are actually undergoing violence because most of them still don't even realize that violent, what, the violence going on around them? I think that's a larger problem and that work is continuing, right? So, but we are talking about emergency responses in terms of at least women who know what is happening, uh, experience the violation as a violation. Many women may not experience it as a, as a violation. They might have normalized it. But for those who have are clear they don't want to take that, they, they find that unacceptable. Is there any support? And so sure, the larger change is an important one. But right now we're talking about women who really want to exit a situation or want something to change. Is the system willing to be with her? And then if the system is broken as now it is, then what do we have to do here on? to make sure that something is there in place, at least from the community. And you know, the, that um, the alternative justice uh, or dispute or dispute resolution, the Nari Adalat is uh, played, you know, whether it's through the Mahila Samakhyas uh, or the Satin programs in Rajasthan, they have been very, very important. 
So we have to invest in those again. Right. Um, any other questions uh, that we would uh, that we would that you would like the panelists to address? So if there is, I know a lot of questions have already been answered uh, by most of you on the chat box. But if there are any questions, can we'll I come be... up with one, Malaya? Can I come up with one issue? Sure, please. This have come to us again and again. Mm -hmm. This whole issue of uh, the hotels that have been opened up uh, for uh, women in uh, in. France, I think, France, France, Canada, other places. They created alternative spaces, taken hotels, etc. Yes. You know, our DV Act says the woman has right to residence with her children, etc. And the man needs to be taken out. Mm. Uh, and I believe that I've heard also a story of, I think it's in Gujarat or something, the panchayat has played an important role and taken the person and put him into the quarantine center because there's no shelter for him. I do know that when we were talking about the fact that the woman has right to residence, we were attacked very badly online. My colleague Kalpana and I, we were tweeting on this issue of women's right to residence. And we were trolled very badly by a network of men who think that women file frivolous cases all the time and it's all about property and stuff like that. But the question today is that if we were to follow our legal framework, then the woman does have a right to residence. And I think the police has to be trained on that, the police and the other persons. Because today the shelter homes as we know are crowded and we don't know what are the safety protocols being put into place out there. We don't have alternatives. Um, so what should we be doing? And I think we need to find out spaces for men to go and for that to um, really be put into place. Honestly, we can't have an abusive man or any other person in the house because not only is the woman being violated, there's a lot of fear of the children. The children are also being violated. You know, it's an intertwined uh, forms of interconnected forms of violence within the household. So I just wanted to make that point. Thank you very I just much. Want to make, I just want to uh, 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 quote uh, something that I came across just now. And it said that if domestic violence or violence against women was an infectious disease, mm -hmm. we would have a, subs a health center at every street corner. So with that, we should. <laughs> I just thought that yeah. it kept. But um, I think uh, you have really, all of the three of you collectively have, uh, have really helped frame the larger, broader uh, questions that, that need to be answered, but also have brought uh, the brass tacks to the table, so to speak. I would quote Sunita ji and say that we've been asked to live with the COVID, but not, or live with the virus, but not live with the violence. So what do we really do? Um, I think uh, also the stories of resilience that you said that, that we don't often hear about, you know, where women are helping each other, where women are collecting each other and collecting money to help each other, to feed their children, to, to really be the support system that otherwise lacks, that has become so arbitrary in the state. And that, as all of you have rightly said over and over again, we have to seek accountability. But even as we do that, how do we come to the drawing board as, as stakeholders, as collectives, as individual women too, because I think that's one of the questions somebody in the uh, question box had asked, what do we do as individuals, as women? For all of us, it may be an easier question to answer, but for a woman in the village or for a woman who, who by herself has less agency and access, if she is the first contact for anybody who's undergoing say domestic violence, um, then what does that woman do? What does she, how does she respond? So are we preparing our women or preparing all of ourselves really to, to deal with this uh, situation? Uh, you know, somebody asked for a post COVID solution, but I'm sure the three of you will agree that post COVID seems like a near impossibility yeah. for the near future. Yeah. So it seems like a moot point right now to speak about a post COVID. It's more important to speak about how do we live with COVID, but how do we mitigate or how do we really eradicate GBV if this is the scenario in which we, which we live. Uh, thank you so very much, all the three of you. As you had begun, you said that we can't find obviously resolutions through a webinar or a series of webinars, but this is a start point. Thank you so much for, um, for generously sharing your time. Uh, I know this is your passion. So uh, given, the, given the scenario in which we are, you would, you would continue and speak to us even longer, I'm sure. Uh, but thank you very much for your time and for taking the questions patiently and giving us pathways to at least begin thinking about. Thank you very much on behalf of Kriya and Kriya Lead.
to all our three very eminent panelists and to our attendees who have been great participants really i shouldn't be calling them attendees thank you so very much if you have any closing remarks we will close the session with that thank you thank you thank you thank you very much thank you very much